chúng tôi có lời hội nghị thì tiếp theo là chương trình thì chúng ta qua chủ đề ba trong chủ đề này thì đầu tiên xin xin nhận do tốt thư theo video là có vị phần tôi đang muốn là và báo cáo đồng chí đã vận chuyển một lần là lúc này xưa theo video còn là tập tiếp từ AP My Nation Any invitations to give us talk on uh, management of uh, atrial fibrillation, a normal device uh, technology for atrial fibrillation. As you can see, atrial fibrillation uh, can be paroxysmal, can be persistent, can be chronic. And you've heard a lot about the pharmacological treatment drugs, antiarrhythmic drugs the importance of anticoagulation to prevent stroke. But beyond drugs, the next line is actually the pacemaker. And we have been using that for many years now, you know, patients. And I'll run through the quickly the history. And of course, next only we talk about AV node ablation and catheter ablation and surgical maze. And these are really, really far down the line. So you will find that actually device therapy is very important in the management of atrial fibrillation. What, what can we do with pacing in terms of atrial fibrillation? Well, you know, patients with documented bradycardia, the classic sick sinus syndrome, you must put a pacemaker. Because if you don't put a pacemaker, these people will faint, they can syncope. The problem is not the AF, but the documented bradycardia. People who have very fast AF, you have to do an ablation and pace. I rarely do that, but that is still a therapeutic option. I have patients where you know you give them anti-arrhythmic drugs. Uh, in the old days, you give quinidine and then they get posars. This one you don't play with any anti-arrhythmic drugs. You just apply and pace. Very effective. What was interesting would be the pacing prevention for atrial fibrillation. Does the pacemaker reduce the incidence of AF? And I will run through very briefly. But you know we won't run through all this bradycardia. Uh, whether it's AAI, DDD, people have tried different pacing sites, multi sites. Uh, time doesn't permit to tell, talk about all these things, but I will concentrate today a bit more about the use of atrial pacing, why it is important, and the use of algorithms, and very interestingly, to the possibility that we can be able to terminate some of these atrial fibrillations when they become a bit more organized. And of course, pacing during atrial fibrillation is something else, and, I, and that is already too late, and I won't talk about that. What are the potential benefits of putting a device in? You know that it reduces the risk of morbidity because if the patient has sick sinus, they will faint. Uh, it reduces the possibility if we can keep the patient in sinus rhythm. You don't need to worry so much about anticoagulation. Yes, anticoagulation is very effective in preventing stroke. But how many patients can you keep them on anticoagulation 24 hours a day, seven days, uh, 27 days a week? Because sometimes they have uh, bleeding, sometimes they have, you know, go for surgery. You have to stop the anticoagulation. And that's where they can get in trouble. And that's why I still try very hard to keep my patients in sinus rhythm. It's just that we don't have the best tools to keep patients in sinus rhythm. I still, because if you can keep them in sinus rhythm, most of the time, the risk of the stroke will definitely go down. And overall, people who are in sinus rhythm do have better quality of life. So the conventional indications I'm not going to discuss. You know, very slow atrial fibrillation. Some patients with chronic atrial fibrillation, you monitor them long enough, they do go into slow air. Even the patients with mitral stenosis or rheumatic heart disease, if you see some of them, if they, if they live long enough, a lot of them, the AV node also becomes sick and they need a pacemaker. Okay, the exciting thing was the pacing for prevention of atrial fibrillation. There was a lot of excitement about you know, AAI or dual chamber pacemaker or some pacing algorithms. Now go through this. The initial studies, this was done in the 1980s and 19, early 1990s, showed that if you pace the patient 
with a single chamber pacemaker, either an AAIR or a DDER, there was a reduction in atrial fibrillation. This is very interesting. That means don't pace the ventricle. Does it not say, at that time they didn't know it was don't pace the ventricle. It was just that the a, single AAI or door chamber was better than the VBI. So we felt, and it was big, suggested that maybe VBI was the problem. And atrial base pacing is better, but if the patient had no bradycardia, it didn't seem to work very well. And hence there was a recommendation in 2005 Pacing to prevent AF without a ready any cardiac indication was not uh, acceptable. Another study from Keeley showed that if you just look at AAI, so we know DDD, BBI is bad. But what about AAI and DDDR? This study suggested that people who only use the AAI, that means don't pace the ventricle at all, actually did much better. So now there is some information that just atrial pacing, don't disturb the ventricle, may be very good. So that's where the minimizing ventricle pacing. It sounds a bit funny that we've been trying to pace the ventricle to prevent the heart from stopping. And now we say don't pace the ventricle anymore unless you have to. So but there are reasons. The reason is because we now know and because of the CRT literature and all those things and not only is chronic RV apical pacing not so good for the heart failure, it is also increases the risk for atrial fibrillation. Partly because you know there is retrograde conduction uh, to the atrium, there's distension of the atrium, there can be reverse remodeling and uh, I mean there's adverse remodeling and hence because of that people went back to look at some of the studies and to the surprise, or not so surprising after all, if the patient actually had a lot of ventricular pacing, for example, more than 40% of the time, there was an increase in the risk of developing not only a heart failure, but also atrial fibrillation. So you can see that it is not just the atrial pacing which is no good, which is good, it's actually ventricular pacing is bad. Whereas if you have less ventricular pacing, it was better. So ventricular pacing was no good. And the most studies show that unnecessary RV pacing actually increased the risk for atrial fibrillation. And hence the rationale, we try to pace the ventricle as little as possible. Of course, if the patient has complete heart block ventricular stents, then you have to pace the, the, the ventricle. No such thing as only pacing the atrium. And interestingly, for every 1% of unnecessary ventricular pacing, you had a 1% increased risk for atrial fibrillation. And I think this is now quite acceptable. The same for heart failure, RV pacing, you want to reduce it. So how do we minimize this without danger? Well, you could try pacemaker algorithms, which I will tell you later on. You can try CRT, which of course is much more complicated. This is a biventricular device. You can try the alternative RV pacing sites, like in the RV septum, but even this, you will find that the studies are not 100% yes. So how do we minimize the AV conduction? This is where all the different companies have got different algorithms. Medtronic as the MVP or managed ventricular pacing, Boston Scientific as the rhythm, M rhythm IQ, and the story as the AAI safe. These are all trying very hard how to reduce the ventricular pacing. And there have been some studies that have uh, a time to suggest that that's definitely these algorithms do work to reduce the ventricular pacing. Let me explain how the because each company is slightly different, but Medtronic's solution is to try mainly to pace in the AAIR mode. They are trying to reproduce that, but of course, you are a pacemaker, you must be able to pace the ventricle, so you try pacing AAI, AAI, but when there is a P and there is no conduction, you still have one gap, but the next one, if there is no conduction, you immediately repace. So in a normal heart, this is quite safe. You have a little bit of a gap and then, uh, and then you, you, you pace. But in an abnormal heart, I will caution you to be a little bit careful to using this algorithm. And then later on, if you do this once, 
again, and if that happens again, then the device automatically switch to DDDR for a while. It's not going to keep on trying this because then truly it may become a problem. And later on, after a while, depending on how you program the device, it will then automatically try again to see whether it can go back to the AAIR. And here you see it prolongs the AV interval. There is a conduction. One cycle, it comes back. The device switch back to AAIR. So it's quite a smart device. So I emphasize for a normal heart, this will be an excellent idea to keep you in an AAIR mode without worrying. At the most, you have a slight gap most of the time. And using this, this uh, algorithm, they have found out that the ventricular pacing has dramatically gone down to in the region of no, 0.1 to 2%. So yes, you still can pace the ventricle, and you still must pace the ventricle when the ventricle is too slow. And the thing is that it has produced the, reduced the unnecessary, what we call unnecessary RV pacing by as much as 99%. So a very effective algorithm. And in one study called the Safe Pace Study, they found that the hazard ratio for developing AF was really reduced by about 40%. So not only did they show that you reduce ventricular pacing, it did show that it reduced the risk of atrial fibrillation. And uh, you can see that here, a study and showing that reduction of the atrial fibrillation. This is a graphic. Unfortunately, you know, like all studies, there will come another study. This is a slightly separate, but different type of study. These were in people who were coming for elective replacement of the device. They put it into an MVP mode. Probably these are sicker patients, you know, because these are patients who are not new patients. These are patients who are coming for elective replacement of the pacemaker, sicker patients. You know, at the end of the day, if you reach 90 years old, maybe 50% of you will get AF. I mean, there's no choice, you know, as we grow older. So these may be sicker patients, and here, however, minimizing the ventricular pacing did not seem to reduce the incidence of cardiovascular hospitalization. Not sure about atrial fibrillation. But so this was a damper on the minimum ventricular pacing. The last one is about pacing algorithms of prevention and AF. This was very hot at the beginning, but you know, uh, with the adopt trial and so on, but subsequently it is of some use, not that frequently used. The pacing algorithms theoretically reduce ectopic beats may reduce atrial fibrillation. And this is available as an atrial preference pacing, atrial rate stabilization, post mode switch overdrive, so you have less atrial ectopics. All these are additional useful features which are present in the pacemakers. Most of the, all the new pacemakers do give this algorithm. I do not routinely turn them on nowadays, but they are useful in a small percentage of patients. And generally, is re the reason is because some of the studies have shown no difference, no difference, a dot showed a difference, uh, Pierre Pace showed a difference. So a ve again, very equivocal. The a test study, which is a major study, showed no statistical significance with the use of all these algorithms. And the assert study, again, shows atrial overdrive pacing, no statistical difference. So for those of us who have been dealing with all these algorithms, we were a little bit disappointed. You know, multi-site, we put three leads in, multi-site, we do all the algorithms. It seems to work in a some percentage. Then there was an anti-tachycardia pacing. This has been available for about 10, over about 10 years. Medtronic is the only company that seems to persist. All the other companies abandoned this. But this was useful in the days when it was even in the atrial defibrillators, but the main thing was anti-tachycardia pacing. The reason is if you see patients with atrial fibrillation, sometimes you can see they actually go into flutter, and then they go into fib, and then they reorganize in the flutter. You give them anti-arrhythmic drugs, they go back to flutter again. So these patients, you can see that the device can actually capture locally and in some short cases, terminate the atrial flutter fibrillation. And you and I know that the longer you are in AF, the worse it is. 
If you can keep the blood out of AF, you are less likely to have AF, less likely to have the burden, and less likely the more sinus rhythm you can maintain. So the prompt termination of atrial fibrillation is useful. But of course you can't cardiovert everybody. So atrial anti-tachycardia is a useful way of trying to keep them in sinus rhythm. And here what the device does is that it pays faster anything which is monomorphic v team paste it and they can be not fantastic but 60 percent you may help some patients if it is very fast completely disorganized zero percent you know those really bad ones you really cannot but then there may be so generally in selected patients especially if you give them anti-arrhythmic drugs you can be successful in anywhere from 30 to 50 to 60 percent and i think this figure is quite accurate uh, i shall not belabor you these are just you know techniques whether you do it as a burst or a ramp and the device also has a what we call a reactive atp where they remember okay this one doesn't work and we'll try another another cycle length but i can show you this example one of my patients here you can see the atrial uh, fibrillation and organized to a little bit uh, like a flutter so the tachycardia cycle line is about 300 over milliseconds the device picks it up it goes in the tachy pace stops immediately sinus rhythm very very effective so this patient had this in fact this device is in him since 2000 and uh, Eight. I think this is one of our VIPs. But uh, you can see very nicely here, sinus rhythm, he goes in the AF, device picks it up. After a minute or so, the duration is only two minutes. And you can see here, the rap pacing, boom, sinus rhythm. So it can be very effective. So how effective is uh, ATP? I said about 40, 50%. Some studies have shown it about 30%. Another study, however, did suggest that it was not that effective in the long run. So finally, I come to what is the most interesting. This has just been published. If you look at the European Heart Journal, it's just out this month. Where they use a combination. We know that anti-tachycardia pacing alone, so-so. Ma managed ventricular pacing alone, okay, not fantastic. So they use a combination of MVP, the anti tachycardia pacing and actually atrial prevention pacing. So actually three different things randomized to three arms, atrial prevention pacing of the conventional and then MVP and everything. So just give me a bit, five minutes more I'm finishing. The primary objective was to see whether this was clearly superior to just conventional pacing. Secondary objective to look at other things. Uh, you can see this is a randomization DDDR MVP plus pacing with MVP alone and you can see that when you have the MVP very minimal ventricular pacing so very little proarrhythmia baseline characteristics about similar and these are the results I think easier if I show you they showed that the composite endpoint of hospitalization of permanent AF at two years so long results there was a 19.8 percent in the group that had this versus 26 percent so there was a 21 percent uh average 21 percent hazard ratio of uh, 0.89 so what this means is that the patients who had the managed ventricular pacing or anti tachycardia pacing did much better all right, P value of 0.04. Cardiovascular hospitalization not that statistically significant. All cause death not statistically significant, but definitely for atrial fibrillation, statistically significant reduction. For permanent AF, very important, definitely almost 60% reduction. So there was a 61% reduction in the incidence of permanent AF at two years. Of course, we don't know what it is at five years, but definitely at two years, this is very interesting result where you combine several different features and the risk of getting persistent AF is also much less. ATP efficacy also goes up in this group. So the conclusion of the study was that in patients who do have bradycardia, who do need a pacemaker, 
Having this, there was a 26% relative reduction in endpoints and a 61% reduction in atrial fibrillation. So I think that the patient really needs a pacemaker, it's really useful and this is available and I also like the cardiac compass in the devices because they will really tell me whether this patient has atrial fibrillation or not because if the patient is at high risk for bleeding, I may cut down the anticoagulation. So these are important things and hence I would like to conclude that device therapy still plays a very important role in the management of atrial fibrillation. We can titrate a little bit our anticoagulation. I mean, we can't give products 150 mg PD to every patient. Some will bleed, some patients need less anticoagulation, some need more. And in our Asian populations, nobody knows what the real answer is. And I think this additional tool of a device helping us to fine tune it will help us not only reduce air burden, but also help to prevent the progression of atrial fibrillation. Thank you for your attention.